So next up, Prince Romba Vernius, one of my new inductions from the Rise of X expansion. Uh, I have not very much experience with playing Romba Vernius. The majority of my experience of Romba is watching him getting played by various different people. Obviously, Romba went through this kind of uh, uh, phase in the Golden Path Internationals. We had like three or four players that were picking him uh, a lot. And he's one of those leaders where like if you use him a lot and you know how to use him, you can do a lot of cool stuff with him. He can be really dangerous. Um, but I still think in a general overall purpose, I still think his use is, was kind of a bit limited on Rise of X. Um, I don't know if I would really say there's many leaders that have gotten worse with immortality. I'm not just saying that Romba is someone that has gotten worse with immortality, but I don't think he's that great. Um, and that's just my, my honest assessment of the situation. Now, this isn't just me being kind of meme -y or trying to, like, you know, have a joke at Lannister's expense or anything like that. Um, I honestly think that Vromba had some pretty interesting niche spots in uh, Rise of X. And I think one of the things with Vromba Vernius is because he wasn't played much, the people that did play him and knew how to use them could exact a lot of, um, of edge over the players because they didn't really know how to stop him. But I think now that that knowledge is out there, it's a big problem for Romba. And people realize that he wants to go, like, wealth a lot and, like, get his dreadnoughts immediately and blocking smug and that sort of thing. Uh, I also think the other issue as well for Romba is that he is unfortunately a victim of uh, action economy a lot of the time. We saw that a little bit in the Golden Path Internationals. Um, uh, the game, like, one of the games where Latin the Bannister Lat played him, where, like, he didn't get Swordmaster and Mentat was getting deprived of him. And even though that Romba in 3 has a lot of firepower because his dreadnoughts are more powerful and obviously he's very combat heavy if you've only got two actions and other players have three or four or now even possibly five with twisted mentat it's just too much for you to overcome um and ultimately i think i i, do, I struggle to see how romba has really benefited from immortality romba is not a person who's been going to research station a lot um obviously it makes sense for him to be like hitting a lot of heart of, of the fremen fremen's a good faction of course they get a lot of forces going on in the combat get some spice go highline obviously that makes sense but I just really struggle to see where he has an edge in immortality uh, that he didn't like already have in X. I, I just don't see how it's really benefiting him at all. In a weird sort of way, I also think the rise of the card draw style leaders has actually hurt Romba more. Because a lot of them have benefits for going, like Lido and Ilban specifically, uh, and even Eliza to some lesser extent, for going to these fact the, the council spaces here. Either they get discounts or more card draw, or Laser can use it to get hold of some spice on the side. Is it means that he specifically doesn't see Dreadnought as much. Uh, there are more leaders that are more willing to go to Dreadnought for various reasons, and it means that Romba can sometimes struggle to get that. And again, because like action economy is really important because of grafting, and just like that compression of action and getting those in, Romba is he either has to get his Swordmaster immediately, or he's really struggling for actions for a lot of the games. So um, again, I don't speak from a great sense of uh, experience, but I just yeah, like Romba is a one trick pony. And his one trick could be really good. Obviously, like, if you want to pick him and your detonation devices is there and you get some dreadnoughts and get hold of some um, some spice, that's great. But the other thing that happened with Romba as well is because people didn't really mine a lot in Rise of X because Doom Desert Planet was not a very good card, it meant that he could get a lot more use out of his ring. You know, spice would build up on these spots a lot more. But now because experimentation exists, people are hitting these far more. So whereas previously you might well see like a round three where no one's gone mining, now this has almost always been hit. This has almost always been hit. This fairly often is hit in the first two rounds. And as such, Romba just doesn't get as much spice now when he visits with his Signet Ring, which means he can't buy his good techs anymore um, and use that to kind of really rock and roll um, on the board. I mean, another thing that also works against him is deck size has also increased somewhat in Immortality because there's so many good cards in the Talaxu deck, which means that Romba only also doesn't see his ring less, which is a big, big part of him. Uh, being able to use your ring to buy a tech um you know visiting anywhere else is absolutely huge and again that's the whole point you go to Hagger basin or whatever great flat and you use that to buy a tech and you pinch it from people but there's less spice and you see a ring less often uh, i think only it's a bit of a disaster for, for romba vernius if there are plotters to be had again having improved dreadnoughts is good four strength dreadnoughts are really good and romba vernius is always as long as you set him up for like the uh, towards the end of the game so that you can take on those high t those high tier combats and look to ch push for those two victory point combats having two dreadnoughts is huge you know four strength is is amazing for deployment 
Uh, but the other issue you've got now is, is there's so many ways to get hold of swords as well. And there's so many intrigues that let you have swords. You know, vicious talent. If someone gets to the end of the track, that's six swords. That's one and a half dreadnoughts for Romba. That's that's a big problem. Uh, and there's loads of swords around now. So I think even that side, he kind of struggles a little bit. Uh, also, the other issue he's got is where do you sit down with Romba Vernius? I don't really know. Like, I guess you sit him in third. The idea being that you go still suits great flat to maybe go conspire for your sword master round three, or you great flat to get hold of like uh detonation early and just like really look to to rock and roll immediately. Training drones is obviously a good option. Um, but I think beyond that, like, are you ever gonna pick Romba in second position? Are you ever gonna pick him in first? Seems kind of insane to me. Fourth. I guess fine. It feels just like a, a worse third. The only thing I will say for Rombo, at least with going third position, is it means round seven, you're first a highliner. So if you can make sure you've got the spice and the highliner and the, the spacing access, you can hit this before anyone else. That's huge. That's probably your one edge of this game. It's it's not enough. I don't want to put Rombo Vernius on D tier. Because I honestly don't think any leader in this game... I'm not really sure I'd want to put anyone in D tier. Not Romba, not Memnon. But Romba Vernius is, is, is ultimately close. Um, you know, where she had some, some kind of fun niche value in Rise of X, I think it has largely been made somewhat irrelevant now. Um, and obviously you can definitely still have some advantages. If you can be Romba in amongst a, a load of card drawers... And, you know, you can have some edge there in, like, the late game combat. The problem is, though, is that they're probably going to have action economy on you for a lot of the game. And that is... That's hard to overcome. That's a real problem. So, I'm going to be generous and put him at C tier. Um, I don't think that would be bad at all. Uh, but I'm going to be kind of kind to him. And, you know, he's got some issues. Like, he probably needs to see a doctor about that, his face there. Um, I'm going to put him at C tier, but I think Romba Vernius is probably the worst leader in the game now. Um, and that might be upsetting to some, and that's fine. But I I just don't see a lot of advantages now. You know, I'm not the most versed, I accept that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure when Lannister did his uh, tier listing with Orski, he also put him at the absolute bottom, basically, with Memnon. Um, so if Lannister's going to put him down there, then I don't feel so bad. So next up is the Beast Raban. Now, I don't keep specific sats about, like, what I play and how I play anything like that. I just, I don't do that. But I'm pretty sure that the Beast Raban has got to be my most successful leader that I've played over the course of Dune Imperium. Uh, Beast has been in since the start. He has always been solid, always been dangerous, uh, and I think has actually possibly gained a little bit in immortality. Um, I think he's definitely up there, and I think the Beast is now one of the premier leaders going into the game uh, for a whole variety of reasons that we'll talk about. Um, so, first off, uh, let's have a look at his abilities here. So, uh, let's talk about his um, Signet Ring first. I'll talk about Fiefdom later on. Signet Ring. Um, getting extra troops in the combat. Uh, get an extra troop um, when you use your ring, and have two troops if you have a faction alliance. That's really good. Um, there is plenty to fight for in the combat. It is it is dangerous. It always has been dangerous. It always will be dangerous. Uh, the beast, what he wants to do typically is just pick an alliance, don't care which one, and jam it. Jam it, get the alliance as soon as possible, then get your improved ring and just start hitting combat. With your improved brutality ring, you can go to a city space and with, with two troops in garrison, you can put in five troops into a combat from like Carfag. That is frightening. That's more than Hardy Warriors. That's uh, that's almost that's basically almost a highliner on the house, effectively. And you're not paying six spice to do it. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, really, really fearful. Um, you can then combine it, obviously, with other types of cards as well. Um, you know, obviously, with negotiate with draws, make yourself really tricky to play against. You can go in heavy, kind of war people away, and then negotiate, pull some of them back to get some extra faction bumps. Also pairs really well with, like, gruesome sacrifice and the harvest cells intrigue, so that you're making a lot of uh, healthy progress along the Talaxu track. 
very, very capable. You should definitely look into do that as well. Um, but you've got to be a bit careful about your faction alliances. You can't just go to full persuasion, expect to be safe, much like the beast, or the baron, I should say. You're going to have to fight for it, and you're going to probably have to lock it up. Uh, obviously, a great spy satellites candidate, as you would have normally expect. Um, but yeah, brutality is a big part of his abilities, and like, you know, you can use that in sort of like, if you can get a faction alliance, say like in the third round, round three, round four, round five, no one wants to fight you because you just have so much firepower and your ring is so, so dangerous. And God forbid you let the Beast Raban get hold of Bama's ambition. I mean, God help you if you do. Now, I want to talk about Fiefdom Second, um, because I think it plays a lot into where I think the Beast has gotten really, really good over the course of the game, in that it makes him deceptively flexible at the start of the game. Now, if you look at it, you start the game with an additional Spice and an additional Solari. And on the face of it, that doesn't look like a lot. And to be honest, over the course of a game of seven or eight rounds, it really isn't that much. You think how much Swordmasters cost, how much trips to like Highlanders cost, it's not really a lot. But what it does is it gives the beast like potential to get all sorts of crazy exclusive access to various places that no one else can do and just jump queues at the start of the game. And the great thing of the beast is that if you put in the right place, he can threaten so many different things the players before you don't really know what to do. They can't stop you doing everything. Uh, and let's give you some examples. So let's say that I decide to, you know, let's say put Beast in the second position here, for example, which is going to go into the position conversation here. So Beast is one of those leaders where if he's in second position, if you let him suckle twice, he gets Swordmaster. That's pretty good. You know, and there's he just any any access, his signet ring, his his uh, experimentations, anything doesn't need any specific. Just just smuggle, smuggle, and he's there, rock and roll. Happy with that. Now this extra spice makes the beast very deceptively useful further back in the line, either in third or even fourth position. Uh, this is far from an exhaustive list of things that you could look to do with the beast in like third position. For example, assuming that first and second go false waste and smuggling. Here's some options for you. Uh, what you want to do? Let's say you want to go, I don't say tech negotiation. Well, target all of the two cost cards here. So wind traps, good for beasts. Water means you can go hardy warriors, hit combat. Sonic snoopers, good. Your signet ring, you want to send that to Carfaglos, putting troops on the combat. Get a load of intrigues, makes you really hard to fight. Uh, let's find some more, shall we? Uh, troop transports, eh, it's probably not the one for you. But the big one you're after is either Mimic film. So you've got that plus one persuasion. Every single round, so you can get a better deck or the big prize, which is memo quarters, and paying that in, that spice to get a faction bump wild wherever you want. For position, very good opportunity to look to try and get hold of that to go to fold space maybe, or even have it in fourth position. And then first is in this horrible, horrible situation where if they go smuggling, they give shipping to second player and they don't ever get the benefit of the um, the Swordmaster unless somehow something gets back round to them. But if they go fold space to block that, then Beast is just going to go ahead and take memo quarters and you're going to cut a car from shipping. Horrible position to be in. Really, really sucks. Other options you could do with Beast. Well, let's say you don't want to go tech negotiation. Well, here's an interesting spot for you. What about Steel Suit? Get hold of that to water. You could also do that in theory by going up here as well, getting hold of wind traps. It's an option. Well, with that extra water, you can do some interesting things. Let's say this is this is one of my really this is a fun move I kind of thought of um, and started doing in the base game. It works also in Rise of X as well. But a real fun way if there is some uh, if first play like if, if assuming that second player doesn't get hold of swordmaster immediately basically round two here's an interesting move for the beast go steel suits get the second water and then what you want to do if it's a combat that has say some solari in it immediate great flat by this point you put in at least three dudes to the combat maybe four if you've got your signet ring and it means that whatever in basically you know so you're getting up to that and then what ends up happening is is that whatever conflict, even if I say somehow only get like third place somehow, some craziness, well, that's free Solari. Well then, next round, what you do is you just hit Conspire. And there you go. Not only is that eight Solari, not only is that access to Swordmaster, but then these troops that you've then spent, well, Conspire, 
gets you two back so you can get right back into the next conflict. And you've got an entry card for your troubles. Um, and then you just go Swordmaster, you pick that up, and then uh, the third match, you do whatever you want. You could go back to the Fremen. Um, you know, obviously you got to bear in mind when you get that Swordmaster, at this point you are absolutely spent on resources, so you're probably pre reliant on Carfag, Arakeen, and Imperial Basin. Um, but uh, yeah, that's an interesting move you can consider. There's an option for you there. The point I'm trying to make here is that the Beast is deceptively versatile at the beginning of the game. Uh, he can do some very funky opening moves that no one either can block or don't want to block. Um, and in the late game, or even in the mid game, if you can get that ring going, like, really, really quickly, Brutality is absolutely devastating and can cause absolute havoc across the map. Um, and you can, like, even just having Brutality, some just gets you conflicts cheaper. Because people are so scared that you're going to use your ring to Carfag and just send five dudes in that, uh, while, you know, say Green might in some other worlds go maybe to Hardy Warriors and put in four dudes... Maybe they only go to steel suits and put in one or put in two. And you just go to Carver and you just cash in cheaply. Like, this legitimately happens. Very, very dangerous. Um, now, Beast does have a bit of problems sometimes. He isn't the best faction. He does need some help getting to those factions. And, of course, if you're spending your effort going for one faction, uh, you've got to be careful of other people if they decide to get in your way. That's your problem. And also, like, if you play Beast and if you go for Spy Satellites and you get Spy Satellites... The table has to stop you. Because if you just take the alliance and just they don't contend you, you just win the game. So you are going to definitely get an absolute ton of table heat. So you've got to be a little bit careful about that. But Beast, really solid, really easy to use, pretty fun. Um, I ain't got a lot bad to say to him. So for the tier listing, um, I still think uh, in Rise of X, he was probably one of the best leaders. But maybe for slightly different reasons. Um, I feel a lot of those have probably carried over to Rise of X. I still think he's S tier. Um, I just think he's very robust, very solid. Um, and it's kind of hard to have a bad game with Rebran because your Signet Ring is always, almost always going to get you out of trouble unless just like some really, really strange stuff happens. And everyone can have bad game. There's no question about that. But like, I was thinking like, do I put Rebran on A here? And I, I just think it's too much. I don't think Rebran is the best leader in the game. I think he's probably like the lower end of the S tier. But I think he deserves to be up here. I think his results probably speak fairly enough for himself as well. Um, he's very highly picked uh, amongst a lot of competitions. And he scores really decently too. So Beast Raban for me, one of the better leaders. If not, I don't know, is he the best leader in the game? I think it depends a bit on what's around him. But he's got to be up there. So only three leaders left to go. Next up is going to be Tezia Vernius, one of our new initiates from the Rise of X expansion. Uh, Tezia was very interesting when she came into existence, actually, in that uh, if you if you trace uh, back through the various competitions we've hosted on hidden assets, if you look at the original Imperium Cup, um, Tezia Vernius was almost never picked like, in the entire first round, so like one play. But as people got more comfortable with Rise of X and how it worked and then started experimenting, suddenly realized, well, Tezia Vernius, in theory, is pretty complex, and there is a lot going on, and there's a there is definitely some nows to get the most out of her. Like, she is unbelievably powerful. Uh, in Rise of X, she definitely rose to be, like, one of the best leads in the game. Possibly the best leader in the game. Uh, you know, uh, if you could get her in second position, like, you were absolutely laughing. Um, and that's not to say that she's dropped down at all. She is still very, very, very dangerous. But again, uh, the, the banning of these has definitely, in my opinion, has tightened a little bit. She's not quite as overpowering compared to some of the other leads in the game. But she's still very destructive. So a quick rundown of Tezia and how she works here. When you pick her at the start of the game, you get hold of these snooper tokens, one for each faction. And the way it works is that whenever Tezia gets to uh, two influence and gains the friendship point for other factions, she takes the token, puts it on her board, and gets the relevant reward. Uh, so the, the start, it's, you know, it's kind of not great. You know, discarding a card for a spice is totally fine. But at the end, you're getting bonus bumps and you're getting the, the trap bonus for getting the alliance as well on the house. Um, which means that she is one that she kind of starts off a little bit slow, but sort of like mid to late game can be absolutely just destructive and really, really, really strong. Typical route you tend to see with Tezia Vernius um, is that they'll look to cash in the spacing and Fremen bumps first. 
A, because these are some of the more competed upon uh, tracks, and obviously getting hold of the bonus bumps on the tracks that are usually less competitive, you know, you felt you wanted to get hold of the Alliance. And you tend to find people who tend to get hold of the Emperor bump last, the idea being that for like round five, round six, round seven, it's two extra troops they can look to get into the conflict so they can obviously look to chase some of the tier threes and get hold of those extra two victory points, which can be absolutely game swinging. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the other reason as well is they tend to do that is because shipping obviously is still really important. And that's one of Tezzy's great strengths. It is her duplicity here. She can use her, her faction, her signet ring, and she can drop a influence with any faction of her choice, anyone whatsoever, and then gain an influence with a, with a faction she hasn't yet claimed the token on. So what you'll normally see, say, in Tezzy in second position is, say, first player decides that they're going to go to Fold Space and block her from shipping. Well, what she does is, first round, she just goes Hardy Warriors, and she just absolutely jams the combat, uh, you know, be it a victory point, be it influence bumps, whatever it is, takes the conflict, and then even if it's not an influence bump, what she then wants to do is her second action on the first round is use her Signet Ring, and then this bump that she had here with the Fremen, she then shifts that across over to the spacing, so that e whether she gets all the second bump from the combat, or the second round she then goes shipping, basically she's almost virtually guaranteed to go shipping second round, and there's not really anything anyone can do to stop it. Very powerful. There is, of course, the old adage of if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And that's very much the case for Tezia. Um, she was unbelievably powerful in Rise of X, and she's still very, very strong in Immortality. Um, I don't really think she's particularly gained a lot from Immortality, being particularly honest. Um, but what she did was so effective, I don't think it really mattered. Um, if maybe it's ever so slightly hurt because factions don't really hang around. If someone gets an alliance, they don't really hang around on full persuasion um anymore but like you kind of you kind of need to defend your alliances a bit more regularly because there's a lot more ways to get hold of those bumps in the first place uh so that's very tricky and of course if tezzy's in the game anyways people are going to be more protective of the alliances because they know the dangers that she can pose with those late game um you know those late game double bumps and like all sorts of crazy stuff she can do you know shipping and just all sorts of she's she's she is the faction stealer leo was the faction stealer she kind of now is the faction stealer and especially if you've got both of those in games which is very possible nothing is safe until you get to six persuasion but what plays for tezia um and it's still again for fries of victim it still is the case is the fact that she can charge an alliance and put someone under a ton of pressure and even if she doesn't claim it she gets to like four for example and then they like push and like secure their alliance tezia doesn't care because she just duplicits then and she duplicits away and she shifts that uh, persuasion elsewhere onto other factions and then pressures someone else and that's the great versatility of Tezzy Avernia. It makes her so, so dangerous. Is that she can, like, take chances and go for lines. And even if she doesn't get it, she doesn't care. Because she'll just shift it away and put it elsewhere. Um, and it's just, it's a horrible spot to be. If you're the alliance that Tezzy is going for, you're forced to go to six and to completely defend it. Even though, like, especially with spacing as well, it's horrible. Because it might mean you have to, like, take a, a trip or two to fold switches. You don't want to necessarily do. But you've got to do it because you're that scared of your alliance. And you've got to do it really really scary as far as immortality is concerned though yeah I, I just don't think it really changes a lot for her you just can play in a similar sort of style um i would say if she can get hold of shipping early which is something you should do if you're playing tessie avernius you're going shipping and it's really hard for people to get in your way to stop you doing that obviously your experimentations are going to have increased value going instead of shipping because you're doing the research so you're at least being able to do uh stuff on the telaxa board as well which is definitely an advantage don't get me wrong um, but yeah, like, she doesn't really benefit a lot from a lot of the Talaxu cards, I don't think, particularly. Um, the row obviously is so good, there's a lot of cards that can supercharge her as well. Um, but yeah, like, she's still one of the best leaders in the game, and she always will be. It's a little complicated getting used to her. The thing you've got to be careful with Tezia, uh, which was a problem sometimes with Rise of Ix, is that you would sometimes have games where you don't actually cash in all your Snooper tokens, and you got to cash in all your snooper tokens as tezzy it's a really important those third and especially that fourth but that fourth reward is so big a bonus bump and the bonus from the track you know whether you're going to emperor to get hold of that uh, those extra troops or you're going like the bene Gesserit to get hold of that entry card i mean that's huge you know those are really really useful they're gonna help you out the back end of the game so really really important um and because there's so many more ways there's a lot more ways to get hold of faction influence Basically, if you're playing Tezzy and Avernius in Immortality, uh, if you've not cashed in all your Oid Snooper tokens, you've probably done something wrong, or you went for some crazy spy satellites game. 
uh, or something bizarre happened. Um, you know, cash in all of them. Make sure you do put F into it. Pressure alliances, and even if you don't actually get a lot of tangible benefit from them, the impact of you threatening like this alliance and this alliance, especially whoever goes for it in a Tezia game, they know they're almost certainly going to have to defend it a lot more regularly than they would do, and that makes them do things that they wouldn't normally do. There's a lot of kind of subtle impacts that can cause over the course of a game, which you don't necessarily notice immediately but can have like a surprisingly detrimental effect to other players. Position-wise, um, she always has been great in second and third position and continues to be so. That has not changed. Uh, first position can be an interesting place for her sometimes, and it can mitigate if you get some kind of weird hands, I guess. Um, you know, because again, like what you can do, obviously, again, it basically here or here, you just you just go fold space basically at some point, or you go somewhere else and shift it, especially with first base, fold space, and then second round uh, or, or first round if you've got both your diplomacies, um, hit somewhere else and then just shift to it and ship and just crack on and just ship and take advantage of that as long as you can. Um, and just that's what you've got to do basically. Third position, um, she can also kind of do similar to that because then if first position goes fold space and second position gets sword master, you're going to cut off first position from shipping pretty quickly so you can get access to that. Fourth, it's a little more tricky for Tezia because you are at risk of getting blocked a little bit. You know, you're not going to see fold space. You're not going to see smuggling. Uh, Still suits is a great spot for, like, for Tezia Vernage to go, but it's very likely third might well do that. But even just going wealth isn't the worst thing in the world either. You know, wealth meant at is Tezia Vernage with your signet ring. Not terrible, barely stretch your imagination, so you can shift there. You just got to make sure you get this as soon as physically possible. Uh, that is a big part of your early game. And then converting that to the late game advantage, getting these these uh, influence bumps, and then re-pressuring these faction tracks, that is what you've got to do in this game. So while I don't think Immortality like has exceedingly helped her in any particular way, I think the strengths that she had in Rise of Vic are just so strong that I don't think it really matters. Uh, to me, I think Tessie Vernis is probably still the queen of Dune Imperium. Uh, she's at least S tier. I think she probably could well be the best leader in the game. Uh, just with the power and the dangers she possesses and the flexibility she offers um, and the fact that it's so hard to kind of get in her way and cause a lot of problems and there's so many texts and cards and intrigues that just accelerate so much it's absolutely terrifying going against a Tezzy Verse and you know if you're on that Emperor Alliance and you're trying to get that and Tezzy is bearing down of it with shifting allegiances at any point I mean, you've got no chance at all. So really, really scary. Um, Tessie does suffer sometimes. If the entire table just gangs up on her, then obviously that's a problem. But that's a problem for everyone, so it's not really a fair point. Absolute S tier for me. Um, one of, if not the best leader in the game, still in Immortality. Uh, and an absolute force to be reckoned with. So unfortunately, it is time for the Battle of the Wooden Spoon. And that takes us to Earl Memnon. Uh, I absolutely love how Memnon has kind of caught on. Uh, I sort of said it once in a video, and it just like it just seemed to work, and a lot of people say it now, which is really awesome. So that, that's awesome, and I appreciate that. Oh, Memnon. Oh, Memnon. Where do we get started here? Um, Memnon in base game was still not great. Uh, my experience of playing Memnon in the base Dune Imperium is limited admittedly and his signet ring is not bad you know just being able just to make a spice on command that's pretty good um you know it's one of is it one of the better rings going i mean it's got at least top half of rings in the game right i think so it's i think it's up there but the problem with earl memnon is connections it always has been and it always will be getting a high council seat and getting an influence bump. It's a water bump, which is nice. And to be fair, in base game, was okay, because as it turned out, there wasn't actually that many wild bumps going about. Shipping didn't exist. Uh, negotiate withdrawal didn't exist. For humanity didn't exist. Web of power didn't exist. There's a lot of cards, a lot of ways now for getting hold of these wild bumps. In the base game, they didn't really exist. You were fairly kind of rigid what you had to do. So heart flexibility was pretty nice. And height counter was good because a lot of the base game, like, if you wanted to win games of the Imperium base game, probably had to, like, find a way to buy a Spice or Slow at some point or another. It's very important. But now there's so many more ways to gain points. It's it's far from as, as easy as that. Oh, Memnon in Rise of X 
was not good. Let's be honest. So where does he stand now that immortality is the case and is in the game and card drawers are better and deck builders are probably better now? How much does it help Memnon? Yeah. I don't know if Memnon is the worst leader in the game. It's got to be there with 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 Robert Vernius. It's I, it is legitimately a battle of the wooden spoon, um, and it's not one that uh, I take any relish in. But yeah, I. What advantages does Memnon have in immortality? It's it's hard to think of them. Um, his the fact that it's a sword. There's quite a lot of a sword master rush means that you're not going to get a high council seat until typically fairly later into the game, and action economy is very important. Which means you're not going to get in your high council seat until much later in the game. Um, and action economy is really important by going smuggling. Uh, which means you get some spice. Uh, but it means you're not fighting the Solari to get your sword master sooner. Which means you're taking like, actions. Which means you're going to get your high council seat much later in the game. You can kind of see there's a bit of a recurring theme here. Memnon does have some fun stuff that he can do. Specifically, Memnon, I think his big advantage... Is that he's a fun tech sniper. Uh, and it kind of in a similar way ish, in a way, to Romba Vernius, uh, where, you know, like he can come up here and he can pinch some, some hit things here. Mo Memnon can be quite an annoying fawn in the side of the beast, funnily enough, because the beast like might get pinched. I've had a game before. I did one on stream here. It was the, the one game I played on stream here. I played as Earl Memnon and I almost won the game. Uh, where I played, I was playing B as uh, Memnon, I think it was in third position i think it was um or maybe second i'm not entirely sure and uh what ended up happening was there was a beast in this position and i figured there was a beast getting picked sub um here because there was memo quarters and i specifically picked memnon to snipe memo quarters and i managed it and it made me get to shipping really early and i got it for a couple of rounds and i nearly won the match it was like an outrageous achievement and i'm very proud that i nearly won a game it was nearly my first ever stream win was of oh memnon would have been absolutely nuts if it didn't happen sadly memnon kind of yeah because that spice like he allows him to do some fun tech sniping in the early game but the problem you've got is if you're gonna do that you might as well just play the beast. Like, all right, Memnon can generate some spice with his signet ring. Well, if you're worried about the very start of the game, beast has it automatically. There's nothing to worry about his signet ring. And his signet ring gets extra troops in the combat, which is great for resources. Uh, if you're interested in passive uh, resource generation, then a laser e Kaz is probably a better pick for you because you can kind of get around her one step ahead with drafting um, and just generate resources. You're not reliant on your signet ring. And your signet ring can give you fold space, which makes your grafting even better. That's a problem. There has been talked about, um, and it has been one of the leaders um, that were modified for the game, was whether um, connections should be a double bump instead of a single bump. And I honestly believe, especially now there's so many ways to get hold of influence, especially wild influence, um, I think this would basically be required now for Memnon to be kind of remotely competitive because that means that you've got some weird funky alliance steals and alliance secures that people wouldn't expect to make you tricky one bump just isn't enough it, it just isn't in the base game it was like nice and it was a useful bonus but it's just so outclassed by so many things now there's nothing about memnon that's really um kind of outstanding at all um, and unfortunately, all right, in theory, you can say, oh, you get behind council seat means I'm going to get a better deck. But yeah, but if you're not getting your hand council seat until like round four, round five, round six, I mean, by that point, it's kind of too late. And if you're getting your high council seat, you go all in, like get your it like round two or like round three, um, you're then sacrificing a lot of action economy unless you think you can just dominate. Basically, the only way you could get around it is if you decided that you're going to go high council early and basically just live on Mentat for the rest of the game problem what if someone say decides to not let you have mentat you're kind of dead so yeah it's it's unfortunate um as for where i would pick memnon uh if i would pick memnon uh i think third position is probably or second position is fine i think memnon i think has to get memo quarters now 
Um, and what you have to do with Memnon is get Memo Quarters and ship first and hope you get uncontested shipping for as long as you can and you just kind of hope it all works out. Anyone in the game can get really awesome decks and really awesome combinations. It could be Memnon, it could be Beast, it could be, it could be anyone. And kind of who you're playing as, I don't think matters a ton in regards, especially in Immortality. Like, there's so many good cards now. Everyone's going to get some good stuff. So you have to worry about that. But that's the problem with Memnon. If I was going to pick him for a specific reason, I'd just pick someone else because they do it better. If I want that wild bump, I'd just pick Baron or Tezia or Yuna. You know, uh, if I want that spice, I'd pick Beast or a laser or, you know, Romba or something who can make better use of that spice, pinching text, that sort of thing. It's It just is the sad situation, Memon. So, yeah, it's not good. I think on reflection, uh, I have to change this. And I think I've now got to bring Romba down. Um, I think having Romba with the things that with Memnon as well on the same. Ariana has some interesting things she can do. But I don't think Jeremy can do it. I think I've got to bring Rumba down. I didn't expect to have anyone on D tier at the start of this tier listing. But I think they've got to be down there. And it's just, you know, it's a shame. Um, one day, old Memnon in Dune Imperium 2nd Edition will be the best leader of the game. And me and CJ will build a shrine and we will worship him daily. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, sadly. So, um, you know, to be soon, maybe. Uh, but yeah, while Memnon had some kind of interesting quirkiness in the base game, there's just nothing special about him now. Um, you know, it's it's not a million miles away from playing with a leader with just no leader abilities. <sighs> Poor guy. And so last up is Princess Yuna Moritani, one of our initiates from the Rise of X expansion. I've got to admit, Yuna is not an easy leader to rank and the reason she's not a very easy leader to rank is that she's yuna is not a very consistent leader she can have games where she gets on a roll and just like has like a lot of fun and a lot of entertainment and when you have a good yuna game it's a lot of fun and you feel very very good about yourself but equally you can have yuna games where you kind of get shot out of the things you need and it's just kind of a miserable existence and you're just kind of etching away through round four round five round six and just kind of waiting for someone to put you out of your misery i've seen both i've witnessed both i've had both the other issue you've got with yuna moritani here is that i don't feel she's really benefited at all in rise of it uh, in immortality I actually reckon in Rise of X, she's not bad. And the reason for that is because her downside of not having any water is not a huge issue. It's a problem. But in Immortality, having that water to hit these mining spaces and get experimentation off is very important. And is a real kind of like uh, background engine room of your economy and keeping that going. So, you know, not having that water, that absolutely hurts. Now, of course, you can say, well, you know, she gains the slot, uh, gains the extra slurry every round. And the idea is, obviously, she's a late game leader. Her early rounds are not going to be great. And the idea is you want to build her up so that in, like, round five, round six, round seven, like, you're going full guns blazing, taking on conflicts, challenging alliances, and using final delivery and just being an absolute pain to people. And just kind of really harassing them. And it's kind of like, it's not so much that you're using her to, like, challenge conflicts outright. What you're almost doing is you're using file delivery to challenge a conflict as, as well as someone's alliance at the same time. So they have to defend their alliance. So they can't really commit to the combat very much. The extra spice is also okay, I guess. But it's the wild bump that you're really paying for. Seven Slurry is kind of pricey, though. And that is a bit of a problem. Now, I do think Princess Yuna is kind of an acquired taste. And is someone that you've just got to play with a little bit to kind of get a feel for how she works. And you've kind of got to suss her out. Like, there's, it's it's hard for me to kind of say, well, do this, do this, do this. Because, you know, it's really hard to know what to do with her sometimes. Her opening rounds can be really problematic. And again, having that no, no, no water, it hurts. And it means that, like, your first round in this game is usually pretty sad. Uh, if you're going to pick Yuna, you almost probably want to pick her, like, in second position, I reckon. And the idea being is that your, your big weakness of not having any water... You've got to mitigate that. And there's two ways you mitigate that. 
Either you go get water by going steel suits, by which point you probably want to be in position three. Or you say nuts to it, and I'm going to go ship immediately, in which case you need to be position two. I think taking Yuna in first or fourth is very difficult and is asking a lot. Um, fourth, because you're just getting blocked all these spots. Like, if you pick Yuna in fourth, and if that goes, and that goes, and that goes, what in the hell are you doing? You've got wealth. Okay, there's free Solari. Then what? Bit of a problem. Same situation for first position as well, where the problem is, again, like, while she has the benefit of obviously generating the extra Solari, how are you actually going to leverage that? If you go smuggling, you get two Solari, great. What are you going to do? You really going to go smuggle Mentap with Yuna first round? Feels kind of bad, you know, um... Feels kind of horrible, being brutally honest. And of course, you're not. If you go full space, you're not shipping, so that's a problem. If you go smuggling, the table is not going to let you smuggle round two. They're just not going to do it. Someone is going to block you. It's it'd be if the table. If you smuggle round round one and round two, the table lets you smuggle again for your swordmaster. That's on the table's fault. That's nothing to do with you. Like it is their responsibility to stop you doing that. So. You know, that's this. It's all basically, it's never going to happen. So, there's no real way to leverage Yuna's advantages here. She needs to be in third position to either threaten shipping or sm or swordmaster, or third position to kind of try to do the same. But it's a bit kind of more stilted. Second position is by far, I think, for Yuna's best position. But third can also be all right as well. There are some other interesting routes you can take with Yuna as well. Um, it has been mentioned before. Um, you can go like um, you know wealth smuggle, um, and in the first round that generates five salari, and then second round you can even consider like um, going uh, wealth again to get your sword master that way. But there's no real reason not to cash in your smuggling here. Bear in mind as Yuna, interesting thing you can do with Yuna, and I have done this before in the first round is if I'm in second position, if first player one goes full space. Then I will go to smuggle, get hold of that, obviously pick up like the two Solari here. But then because I'm in second position, I know that I'm going to see how to smuggle next round. Is then the next action I actually go Mentat. And even though it looks kind of insane that I'm not going to have any resources, it gives me an extra action. It means I can bear down on the conflict here, maybe to steal suits or get to wealth or secrets. And just kind of get some extra action economy going because I know that when it comes to the third round, I don't need to worry about it. Because I've got this shipping bump. I can cash in for two. And then I also get the extra bill, uh, extra benefit for the Solari here. So I then get six. And from nothing, I've got Swordmaster. And that's pretty cool that Yuna can do that. And it's something you definitely shouldn't try to ignore. Um, but you've got to be really careful, Yuna. It is very easy to completely crash your economy. And if you crash it and you can't recover it, you're dead. Um, and, uh, yeah, good luck trying to get out of that one. So, you've got to be really, really careful. You know, pick up specifically, pick up particularly, and do that. But, yeah, I, I don't think she's really benefited at all in immortality. Um, shipping is kind of probably more contested, if it potentially. Uh, if you don't get in there first, it's really hard to do it because there's a lot of ways for people to get these extra faction bumps now, uh, be it from, like, uh, intrigues or um, from things that give wild bumps or whatever else. There's uh, graph cards, you know, face dance that might get you there early, stuff like that. So you've got to be really careful. You're picking, you've got to be pretty confident you're going to ship first or get Swordmaster first. If you don't get either of those first, you're probably not going to win the match. Um, and that's me being honest. You must secure one of those as Yuna. If you don't, it's pretty bad times for you. So ranking unit is definitely a little tricky. I think she's probably fairly middle of the road. Um, I think kind of like as a B is probably about right. I don't think I'd go too overly crazy with her. Um, she's somewhere around this sort of middling pack. I can't really put her any higher. I don't really believe. I don't think she's consistent enough. Uh, you do some fun stuff. Again, when she's rolling, she's a lot of fun. If you can get far delivery going, there's wild bumps and challenging alliances at the end of the game. It's a nightmare to defend. Really, really brutal. Um, but it's just hard to have that amount of Solari going. Um, you know, unless you're like shipping loads or getting wealth loads. Conspire is actually a pretty good place for Yuna to go, by the way, because it's giving you those extra troops. 
Um, and then conspire is basically giving you a uh, final delivery. That's a move I like doing the end, towards the end of the game is go conspire for the emperor bump with a faction that's less likely to be competed. Uh, and then that pays the final delivery and like in a city and that's like four troops and double bumps and stuff like that. That's a really pesky little end combination of people that are trying to defend the emperor alliance for really hard for them to commit to that without compromising their own moves. It's very tricky, but she's not really consistent enough. I don't think to put her much higher than that. So that is going to be my tier listing here. Uh, that is what I think of the leaders. I think I'm pretty happy with it all overall. Um, again, I think the distance between S and like D here, as it turns out, I think is a lot tighter than it used to be in Rise of X. Um, but I think it's a fair reflection where we're at, at the moment. You know, Ilban, for example, has definitely been a big crew. I think if I was doing Rise of X, Ilban's probably down here. And he's now up here, which is pretty much saying a lot. Especially, like, if, like Paul as well would be, like, down here. And I legit think he's definitely in amongst the B pack now, for sure. Uh, Alayza probably similar as well. I think she was probably C. She's at least B now. Uh, but really, when you're picking her, you, it's in an advantageous position. She might well be up here as well. Um, so you can see definitely the movers of that. Uh, really thought I was considering maybe putting, like, Baron down to A. But I think he's still got enough innate power and strength that it's always fearsome to go against. Uh, but that's my assessment of where we're at here. So let me know what you think. Um, I think it's probably there or thereabouts. Again, this is very anecdotal. Um, and you might have different opinions. But uh, I don't think looking at them, any of them are that particularly outrageous. Um, I don't have an F rank. It's for good reason. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for watching. Take care of yourselves. Hope you may have learned something as well. Uh, we'll get some more content going on. We've got the podcast coming soon uh for spice satellites we've got the homebrew leaders i do still want to try and sit down and do some more looking into uh my streaker games i won on stream a couple weeks back just haven't much time uh and of course we play a content coming on as well the world of life open is almost coming to a conclusion over the next few days and then we've got our next big tourney which is not a million miles away thanks for watching everyone take care of yourselves we've got a patreon we got a ko-fi all that lovely good stuff see you soon